everyone, I'm a registered nurse. I am the Senior Vice President of Patient Care Services and the Chief Nurse Executive at St. Joseph's Health in New Jersey. And I'm also the Columbia University School of Nursing Association's President. It is so good to be with you today. So many years that we haven't been together, very unprecedented times, but to be in person amongst friends in our home is just a great way to start reunion. So I'm so grateful to each and every one of you for stepping forward and saying yes to the invitation to be with us today. It is a pleasure to be here this morning with Olga Brown Vanderpool, the Capsona board member, as well as our fellow members of the reunion planning committee, specifically Laura Artizone, Daniel Billings, Catherine Brewer, Olga again, Hilda Haynes-Lewis, Sandra Johansson, and Julie Yushimashi. Thank you very much for assisting us in shaping today's program. We would not be able to be here though today without giving thanks to our colleagues in development and the Alumni Relations Office who helped make this day possible. A very warm welcome to the graduates from the two and seven years who are also celebrating milestones this year, 2022. And a special acknowledgement to the many alums who graduated recently. You are the future of Columbia nursing, and we are delighted that you could attend and be with us today. Many thanks to our students who are also joining us. Some are program participants. Today is going to be a wonderful day with lots of new events. But there is also time for us to relax, to chat amongst friends, and explore this beautiful building, our home. We will soon hear from Dean Frazier and the Dean's Council with the State of the School report. We will then hear from some students on what it is like in the day of the life of a Columbia nursing student. After a short break, we will go into our two short afternoon programming sessions each with the option to listen to a dynamic speaker or to attend a simulation escape, the room challenge. At 1.30, we will do a champagne toast. That sounds like a good time to be there, right? 1.30, mark it down. Uh, to our 130 years of an amazing history of Columbia nursing. We will then resume back here on the seventh floor at 2.30 for the alumni award ceremony to honor this year's recipients. After that, you will have the opportunity to enjoy a robust reception in the first floor lobby, featuring a student poster session and a history room with lots of food, drinks, conversation, and laughter. And don't forget to visit the second floor and purchase some Columbia nursing swag. It is important to Columbia's Nursing Alumni Association that we continue to develop new and meaningful ways for graduates to stay engaged and get involved, whether it be through volunteer opportunities or hosting and attending events. We're always thinking about expanding alumni connections with the school as well as with each other, or to strengthen our ties with current students and the broader Columbia community of over 370,000 alumni around the world. We hope you'll enjoy today, um, and we are also inviting you to consider June 1st, which is new student orientation for a Columbia Nursing Trivia Night. Come back for an exciting evening of fun and to welcome our new students. And on a personal note, I just want to thank all Columbia nurses. Over the past three, and a, three years, two and a half to three years, we have been faced with unprecedented times in healthcare. Without nurses, who are the backbone of the healthcare system, patients would never have been able to navigate an odorless, tasteless, or invisible virus. As a nurse executive, and quite frankly, someone diagnosed with COVID and was critically ill, I was saved by the nurses at Memorial Sloan Kettering who took care of me while I was in that intensive care unit. It is for them. They truly never showed their fear, but only the joy of their work. Through their eyes behind their gear, I was able to see hope. And as a result of hope, I was restored to wellness. We celebrate all nurses as we enter Nurses Week on Monday, all nurses around the world and their profound impact on humankind. Without those human connections, where else would we be? Where else would we be? Thank you, everybody. Enjoy this day, and I invite Alga Brown Vanderpool to the podium, who is our Capsona board member, who will offer some remarks as well. Enjoy this day. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. 
I am Olga Brown Vanderpool, class of 1970. I bring greetings to you from Copsona, the original alumni association founded by Anna Maxwell and her first class of nursing graduates. I serve on Copsona's board of directors. Our president, Dr. Lois Glazer, class of 1960, regrets that she is unable to be here in person today. I am pleased to announce that Capsona is presenting the school with a check for 60000 for the benefit of the scholarship fund. The check, is <laughs> the check is in the mail and should arrive. <laughs> and should arrive early next week. <laughs> it is gratifying that we're able to meet in person again here in the school's beautiful new building. I now would like to introduce Dr. Lorraine Frazier. Dean, <laughs> Dean Lorraine Frazier. Well, we're very happy that check's in the mail. <laughs> and, and Kevin, I'd like to start the way you started. I'm Lorraine Frazier, and I'm a registered nurse. There's no better time to be a nurse than today. So what a great day this is. We have been so busy. Um, our communications department is having us all over New York, right? We've been on NBC this morning, and We'll be on ABC, Feel Good Friday. Our students are going to be there. New York won this afternoon. A student is going to be there, and we're going to be ringing the bell at NASDAQ. So, my goodness, it's a time. Yes, it's a time not only we feel proud to be in nursing, but our nation feels proud of what we've done. And I would say the globe feels proud of what we've done. And um, Kevin, it's so good to hear your story. You know, it's so personal. Um, to talk about just the companionship of who we are. You know, um, we're more than just practitioners. We, are, we indwell ourselves and our profession in a very, very special way that's important to health. So thank you for sharing that. And so I'm thrilled to be here today because we're almost all in person, right? Since 2019. Can you really imagine We've been through it and we're back and it's so good to actually get to hug people and, and, and really feel your presence here. And we feel your presence here. And when you've come in from other places, you do not know how much it means to us to feel that and feel that support. So thank you all so much for being here. And for people who are on our virtual audience, uh, we, we don't see you, but we, we feel your presence as well and we wanna welcome you. So, and we have a special class here today, the class of, 19, of 1970, 1971, and 1972. If you're part of that class, can you please stand? Oh, very good. <laughs> Celebrating their 50s, 50th year. And I bet it's gone fast, hasn't it? <laughs> it flies past. And um, I'm delighted also to be here because, as uh, Kevin suggested, it's we're going into National Nurses Week when the entire nation is celebrating what our calling is about. And at the same time, we're gathering to celebrate Columbia nurses' um, contributions to this. So we all can take a lot of pride this year. And I will tell you that for the 20th year in a row, who knows what has happened for 20 years in a row for nursing? Trust. Trust, yes. We are the, ranked the number one of all professions based on honesty and ethics by the Gallup Poll Organization for the 20th year. So pretty amazing. A notable symbol of national esteem. Now we begin. Um, what I will say later today on behalf of you, I'm going to, all of us, ring that bell in the NASDAQ stock exchange. And I'm hoping that the, the market is doing well. <laughs> I don't want to ring it. Maybe we'll bring it good luck, right? I'm hoping. So, um, and so we're going to let the nation know that 
thank uh, them for honoring us for uh, who we are and who we are as a profession. So we'll get Columbia's name up there. It'll be on the board in front of uh, NASDAQ and it'll be in Times Square, right? We're gonna be everywhere. So if you're out and about, but you, you all will be here and it'll be downstairs in uh, the first floor. We'll have it, um, a video of it. Is that right, Linda? Live stream, live stream. So please um, join us in that. I feel thrilled that you can all join us virtually. And finally, it's a particular pleasure because this is a special anniversary for Columbia Nursing. How many years is this? 130. Can you believe it? It's our anniversary, and we are a seminal school based on nursing research. Still, our role in paving the way for advanced nursing education, advanced practice, has changed nursing across the nation and the globe. Our establishment of the nation's first independent primary care practice run by nurse practitioner Stephen Pereira is here on the front row. You'll hear from him. And our leadership in social justice and health equity. Um, we're known for that. This is your school. This is your school. And we've had a major impact on nursing throughout, their, throughout our history. So I hope that you'll get a chance to visit the history room. Um, where is that? 114. Please go by. There are um, inspiring books and artifacts that you want to visit, and it'll make you proud. I know you're already proud to be part of Columbia uh, alums. In addition, you want to be sure to look in your packet. There's a history booklet in your tote bags, and we're very uh, thrilled for Sue. Sue, can you raise your hand, stand up? Let's thank you, Sue. <laughs> Class of 1959, I have to look at that to be sure. Um, <laughs> for that um, commemorative account of our school. And we're very, very proud to also include in there a copy of our um, journal, our spring magazine. If you haven't looked at it, please do. If you'll look, we have a section on a new calling which is amazing. We have a turn, stories of attorneys, dancers, um, you know, what is, he's a, an actor, and they're all coming back, uh, why they've come back to nursing, and there's interest from Oprah's magazine on these stories. So really, really, the pictures are fabulous. And then there's another section you might be interested in. Um, what is, 130 years of Columbia mean to you, and these are part of your story, so please look at the magazine. It's, it's a wonderful um, publication, as it always is, is, but I'm particularly fond of this one. So, um, and I hope you'll be able to stay for the Alumni Awards this afternoon. We'll be presenting Distinguished Alumni Awards to Felicia Bowen, um, a class of 2010, Pamela de, de Cordova, 2011, Poem, you can clap, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 2010, and Karen Disjardins, 2005. So, all right to them. And we'll also be giving our Early Career Alumni Award to Megan Redding um, Tertio. Is Megan here? She's coming this afternoon. Okay, good. And so, and I have the honor right now of presenting the Anna Maxwell Award which is conferred on alumnus or alumni whose achievements and records of service exemplify the ideals and traditions of this school and our founder. Two, Joan Hagen Arnold, class of 1969. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I am flabbergasted. Thank you. It's always my honor. This is my home, and I know it's your home. And we celebrate all the good works that we do together. We are a community, and 
it's a privilege for me to have been part of it for all these years. And thank you for your leadership. Incredible. Thank you. So let me say a little bit about Joan. <laughs> She's been uh, nurturing connections among her classmates for over 53 years. They have monthly Zoom calls. She works with our Office of Development, Development and Alumni Relations, is a member of the Annual Fund Committee, and is a past Distinguished Alumni Award Chair. For years, she has helped to share our school's proud history with students and alumni. And Joan was an integral part of the 2019 Anna's Place campaign, which allowed us to dedicate an area right out here um, to our founder. Joan, we are so very thankful for your work and for all that you've done really to bridge the students and the alumni over time. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> And I'm frankly in awe, as we all are individually, collectively, and as an institution, how we've managed really to navigate these unprecedented times. Not only has the world been set on its heels by COVID, and particularly here in New York over the past two plus years, but we've been roiled by heightened awareness of racism, of the fact that structural aspects of our society result in inequities and disparities in health care and in health care education. These challenges have tested us, but they have not broken us. As nurses, ever since its er their earliest days, we've adapted, we've adjust adjusted, and we've changed. And at Columbia, we're learning how to teach, learn, and work, how to change how we do those processes. We are changing the way we care for our patients and we're changing the way we relate to each other. And at the same time, we're holding firm to our ideals and our principles. In a word, we are rising to the occasion as we always do. And as typical of nurses, we are putting other people first, right? We're putting our patients and our students first. And as COVID surged, our our students and our faculty were out there. And I will tell you why they were there is the students called immediately and said to Junie Honig and to me, we, we wanna be there, you know? And it was really amazing to think about that when people were scared to death, there was no vaccines and we, we didn't understand it, but they wanted to be there and they were. And they conducted education. We had clinics across the city and we took care of vulnerable populations. We stepped up our commitment to doing research, to expand our knowledge about healthcare disparities and how to best address them. And we launched two new centers last year, the Center for Sexual and Gender Minority Health Research and the Center for Healthcare Delivery Research and Innovation. So we're very proud of those. And these are in addition to the center we started in 2020, 20, um, uh, the Center for Research on People of Color. So in this past year, we've also renewed and strengthened an anti-racism mindset across the school, as well as with our partnership with CUIMC, we work together. We've redoubled our efforts to foster a diverse and inclusive environment in every level of our institution, in our curriculum planning, in faculty development and recruitment, and in the recruitment of a diverse student body. And I'm pleased to report that we have made measurable progress toward, toward diversifying our faculty and our staff. And you're gonna hear more about that in a few minutes. And you'll also hear more about our holistic admissions process, which is ensuring that just as we always have, we have a rigorous assessment of our, our applicants' ac academic qualifications, but we're now applying a similar degree of rigor to enrolling a diverse student body. This process is supported by a new, um, newly reorganized system of support services called PLAN, P-L-A-N, which stands for Pathways to Leadership and Advancement in Nursing. And we wanna ensure that the students that we admit are supported to be successful in this program. I always say, if we admit, we commit to getting the students through, and we really work on that. Another notable program, our new initiative, is the OPEN program. 
online prerequisite entry into nursing. So now if you want to come to Columbia, you can take some of your prerequisites online. And that makes students feel comfortable that they can come to Columbia and be successful. And it also ensures us that they have a good foundational start in those prerequisites. We're starting two new certificate programs that we'll launch this fall. One in transgender and gender non-conforming health for nurse practitioners, and one in palliative care for nurse practitioners. So we're, we're going, we're innovative, we're influential, we're doing all the things that Columbia has always been noted for. And we continue to shine in terms of our metrics among our peers. For the third year in a row, we rank fourth in among all nursing schools in the country in terms of NIH funding, which is remarkable given the number of faculty we have. We don't have a huge faculty, but we have a dynamic faculty. What an achievement. In the US News and World Report, we just ranked our master's degree program number six our DMP program number fifth in the nation. On an individual level, eight of our faculty and alum were tapped as fellows of the American Academy of Nursing this year. We're so proud of them. And two members of our faculty were inducted into the Sigma Theta Tau Honor Society of Nurses International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame. And there was a pandemic going on. <laughs> So these achievements, especially in times like these, are an enormous testament to the faculty, our staff, and our students, and our alumni who make Columbia nursing the innovative and influential. Those are the two eyes I always talk about. We need to be innovative and we need to be influential about that innovation across the nation and the globe, and we're good at that. I also want to express my deep gratitude to our leadership team. And you all can stand when I call your name. Uh, they are amazing. Betsy Corwin, Vice Dean for Strategic and Innovative Research. <laughs> Stephen Ferreira, Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. <laughs> Janice Grady, Assistant Dean for Development and Alumni Relations. <laughs> Big clap for you. Judy Honig, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs. Tonda Hughes, Associate Dean for Global Health. <laughs> Linda Muscat Rim, Associate Dean for Marketing and Strategic Communication. <laughs> and Rebecca Schnall, Associate Dean for Faculty Development. Is Rebecca here? I don't think she's here today. Vivian Taylor, Associate Dean for Diversity and Cultural Affairs. <laughs> Jason Wright, Vice Dean for Finance and Administration. And last, but certainly not least, Judy Wolf, Senior Associate Dean for Student Affairs. <laughs> and a very, very special thanks to our Office of Alumni and Development for organizing today's events. Well done. Well done. I'd like to make one final point before I hand up the rest of this presentation. The impact, those two eyes, and influence of our school is due to the commitment of our extraordinary faculty, staff, and students, and alums throughout our 130-year history. We're building upon what went before us, and we know that, we value that very, very much. It is the people who uh, make, embody the mission of our school, and I wanna thank you all for um, your help in what you do and what you bring to us. With your help, we continue devising new ways of educating nurses, right? comes from Columbia, exploring new ways of, and areas of research, evolving new paradigms of patient care that's got to come, and of course, identifying and innovating new ways to advance the profession of nursing regionally, nationally, and globally, and then even including ring the bell at NASDAQ this <laughs> afternoon. Thank you very much.
I love our Dean. <laughs> well, greetings to you all. <laughs> as always been stated, I'm Vivian Taylor, and I'm so pleased to serve as our Associate Dean of Diversity and Cultural Affairs. I want to begin by reading our land acknowledgement statement. And it reads, we acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Lenape people on which we learn, work, and gather today at Columbia University School of Nursing. Lenape means real person or original person. And it is important to remember that Lenape collectively are a living and breathing community. Let us honor their legacy. Let us commit ourselves to the struggle against the forces that have depossessed the Lenape and other indigenous people of their lands. We stand strong in our commitment to support and defend all marginalized people of this land who have been stripped of their rights to self-determination. End of statement. So happy to provide some updates on our diversity, equity, and inclusion work at Columbia Nursing. We have stayed the course in our commitment to building and promoting a social justice and anti-racist environment and culture. The National Association of Officers in Higher Education has developed 10 priority areas that comprise an anti-racism framework. These priority areas are one, institutional structure, two, policies and procedures, three, resource allocations, and academic equity and student success. Five, curriculum and pedagogy. Six, hiring, retention, and promotion. Seven, institutional programming. Eight, educational training, employee development. Nine, campus climate and culture. Ten, admissions and access. And I'm pleased to report that we have actively engaged in all 10 of these high priority areas. <laughs> We, as an institution, are willing to be self-critical. We're open to hearing and addressing concerns brought to our attention and providing solutions to the best of our ability. We are especially attentive to the issues that our students bring to us. And so we have been having ongoing listening sessions with them. Areas that we are continually working on include communication and transparency. One way to address this has been to provide written updates to faculty and staff of the activities and initiatives coming out of the offices to faculty, it's coming out of the offices that make up the Dean's Council. Uh, it was introduced to you a few minutes ago. For our students, we have created a quarterly diversity newsletter that highlights the diversity and equity work within the school. We have diversity task forces that have been charged with looking at our policies and procedures as it relates to student admissions and retention and faculty hiring practices. In this regard, for student applicants, as has been mentioned, we have established a holistic admissions process to ensure that we look at the whole applicant so that we admit qualified and a diverse class. Our task force on student retention has made several recommendations that support student learning and success at our school. Our task force on recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce engages with other offices and committees within the school, such as the Human Resources and the Office of Faculty Development, to track hires and support tenure promotion and career succession information sessions for our research faculty, our clinical faculty, and for our staff. We desire a hiring search process that is inclusive. And so we therefore require implicit bias training for all members of our search committee. We are tracking our progress in increasing diversity in our students, faculty, and staff, and the numbers are going up in the direction that we like. Over 47% of our full-time regular staff identify as a member of an historically underrepresented group. Over 8% of our new faculty hires in 2021 are from underrepresented groups in nursing. And we have a 10% increase in diversity represented in our student body over these last few years. Our anti-racist social justice institutional programming 
has been robust. We continue our collaboration with the Lenape Center and Gathering Ground organizations. And in partnership with them, we've offered a three-part series on holistic healing with plants. We kicked off Black History Month with a presentation by Dr. Robert Fullilove, Associate Dean of Community and Minority Affairs at Mailman on activism then and now. We co-sponsored with the CUIMC Chief Diversity Office a moderated conversation with Dr. Ibram Kendi, author of Sun's Diversity Book Club selection, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And our next book club selection, which we are reading now, is Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wickerson. Continuing our pipeline in initiatives, we held a virtual visit for 10th and 11th grade high school students in the New Jewish Home Career Development Program. That included a faculty, staff, and student panel and an interactive simulation exercise. As a result of the work of Dr. Kelly Bryan and the DEI Task Force on Community Services and Programs, we are launching a summer health professions education program for high school students and have partnered also now with PS 128 right across the street to have FNP and PNP students provide a program on brain health for elementary school students at Washington Heights. We have hosted self-care programs and a special discussion session on remembering Washington Heights officers Jason Rivera and Wilbert Mora. We held an inspiring Women History Month program with Drs. Natalia Sineas and Dr. Jennifer Dorn and Dr. Edwidge Thomas, moderated by Dr. Marlene McHugh on the topic, Women Leaders in Healthcare, the Challenges, the Lessons Learned, and the Triumphs. Other programming uh, that we just recently had included the meaning of Ramadan and how do we better support those observing Ramadan. We're now looking at best practices in, in caring for Orthodox patients and supporting our Asian Pacific Islander students, colleagues, and friends. We're also now looking forward to finalizing events and recognition of Pride Week and Juneteenth observances. And as in the words of the Negro spiritual, we're keeping our hands on the plow and holding on because there is still much to do. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Betsy Corwin, the Vice Dean of Strategic and Innovative Research, and I'm thrilled to be here with you all today. It is my pleasure to share with you a few of the highlights, and I could go on for a long time, from our research division that occurred during this really remarkable year and, you know, remarkable in so many ways. First, I want to remind you of our five centers of excellence, three of which, as, as Dean Frazier mentioned, had just been initiated when we met with you last year, the last time we met. And these centers um, met all in some ways, and some you'll be able to tell by just their, their names of the centers, but all of them in some ways, all address our true mission of health equity and social justice. So in some ways, in some way, the research is moving the, the needle towards um, that, those goals. So these include the Center for Research on People of Color, which is led by Dr. Jacqueline Taylor. This is a, an amazing group, and there's many, many different seminar series and uh, lectures, guest lectures that Dr. Taylor has brought in, book reading clubs, it's really been amazing. We also have the Center for Healthcare Delivery Research and Innovation, which is led by Dr. Lucine Pagosian, and this deals, this focuses on um, nursing, nurse 
um, health and, as a nurse, as well as staffing issue and patient outcomes. It is, uh, she's a remarkable researcher and this center is likewise. We also have the Center for Sexual and Gender Minority Health that is led by Dr. Tonda Hughes, who'll be speaking soon. And uh, this center also is making inroads, not just in research, which it is, but also the discussion of clinical uh, considerations of trans patients and others and just the sensitivity there bringing that to our forefront as nurses. We also have our two long-term centers that you've probably heard about before, the Center for Health Policy, led by Dr. Pat Stone. Uh, and this center, I'll, I think about the Center for Health Policy as being the ultimate um, delivery mechanism of all the other centers works. We really need to not just stay in academics and do, do this wonderful, exciting work, but really make it happen to change lives. And lastly, we also have the Precision and Symptom Self-Management, the PRISM Center, that you all have um, heard about for years that has been led by Dr. Sue Bakken. Uh, all of these centers have been very active and are truly stimulating, never stopping stimulating the intellectual growth of our school and the excitement of our students and uh, just the patients that, that we interact with. I also have the privilege of letting you know that one of our newest junior faculty members, Dr. Veronica Barcelona, who is affiliated with the Center for Research on People of Color, received just recently the highly prestigious Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation Award for her study, and listen to this, how <laughs> exciting this is, using machine learning and natural language processing to measure racial ethnic bias in obstetric settings. As we all know, Know the disparity in maternal morbidity and mortality is, you know, just stunning, and um, and being brought very much to light these days. You know, if it could happen to Serena Williams, it could happen to any of us. Um, this is an incredibly uh, um, innovative, multidisciplinary, um, and creative proposal, and it really, uh, sh we are Columbia Nursing is literally at the cutting edge of machine learning and natural language processing to change clinic, to improve clinical outcomes in the entire world of nursing research. I'm also thrilled um, to let you know that Columbia Nursing is the place to be for successful research senior, mid-level, and junior faculty. We have um, recruited four new stellar faculty, two at the Fuller Associate Professor and two assistant, assistant professors. They include Dr. Phoenix Matthews from the University of Illinois Chicago, who will be joining us as a full professor. Dr. Matthews' community-focused research is on the health of underrepresented populations. For example, and I love this example. Their research findings played a major role in Chicago being the first US city to ban menthol cigarettes, which are especially reprehensible in that for decades, they have been targeted towards black citizens and are the most nicotine heavy cigarettes sold in the United States. Dr. Matthews was tireless in their research and public advocacy to get this initiative passed. And as I was preparing these, um, these words a couple weeks ago, I'm thrilled to report that the FDA just extended the ban on menthol cigarettes nationally. So it's a huge, exciting achievement. And we are thrilled that she is coming, to, that they are coming to join us. Dr. Corinna Latusia Weinberger is another um, new faculty who will be joining us this summer, or has just actually started. Um, also with a long history of NIH funding and bringing a new NIH R01 award, she, she is joining us from Rutgers as an associate professor whose research focuses on strategies to increase the acceptability and use of HIV PrEP protocols calls to reduce HIV spread among gay men in Eastern Europe, including, as we speak, in the Ukraine. Some of her, um, her work is being done there, as well as other parts of Eastern Europe. And it's really breaking down barriers, hopefully breaking them down, barriers to this type of treatment for HIV-positive individuals. We also are recruiting two junior new faculty. First, Dr. Natalie Benda, a PhD prepared human factors engineer, who will be bringing with her 
her an NIH award as well, an R00 award, to lead a collaboration with faculty from the Departments of Engineering and the Department of Medicine to design user-friendly human computer interfaces to better support patient health equity. This is an important step for the school for many reasons, but in particular today I want to mention it is the first collaboration that the School of Nursing has had with engineering, which I, some of us were talking today about nurses and, and engineers. Um, there, and one of the few that Columbia Nursing has previously actually even held with a main campus department. So it's exciting. This is the new era. Not only are we, um, are we gaining from these collaborations that they're gaining from us. You know, we are bringing the, this important perspective of our field. Dr. Megan Turchio, you heard mentioned earlier today, is also joining us. She is a Columbia prepared um, nurse who is bringing uh, to the school a K99 R00 NIH award that is also utilizing natural language processing to extract electronic health record data from patients with atrial fibrillation to develop in, um, initiatives and um, to develop newer and sooner treatments that can improve patient symptoms. Okay, in addition to, I'm almost done, in addition to to all of that, our faculty, as you heard Dean Frazier say, received a number of NIH awards, 26 happens to be the number, this past year to keep us at the very prestigious number four position in NIH funding. Among the top 80, there's 80 schools of nursing that are listed on that award list, and we're number four. Our faculty also received funding from the Alzheimer's Association, AHRQ, the American Cancer Society, RWJ, and the Hearst Foundation. So it's not only NIH funding, but, that, um, but it spreads to different groups as well. And lastly, with the support of, of um, Jason, our Vice Dean Jason Wright and the Dean and our um, Jason from the Finance Office, I'm happy to share that we have expanded our Office of Scholarship and Research. And I'm looking at Elaine Larson here. I don't know if, we've, uh, if it's exciting because it all started with Elaine. Um, and we've expanded by hiring a full-time data manager as well as a new OSR operations manager, which I love that term, an ops director, to oversee our strategic initiatives, including ensuring coordination across our centers because ultimately, you know, they do overlap, but the mission is the same, change practice, discover new knowledge. And we also have um, hired a new assistant director to provide editorial assistance um, um, to all faculty and students in the school. So that's it today for today. It's been a real privilege to talk to many of you, and congratulations on your award. So exciting. And uh, it's just a little bit of what we do in our wonderful School of Nursing. Thank you very much. This, uh, this in introduction, <laughs> the introductions aren't exactly going smoothly, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Judy Honig. I'm the Vice Dean uh, for Academics and Professor here. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of things about the academic work that we've done. It's been really, we've been really, really very productive uh, on, in some themes, a little bit more focused. Um, and on the, on the area of uh, diversity, and inclusion and our commitment to social justice. We've done a lot of work with the curriculum and with, the, with academic affairs. Faculty develop and an, development and anti-racism continues. We participate, as you've heard, from Vivian and others with the university, with CUIMC, and, and within the school with lots of activities, workshops, um, educational activities, courses, and professional conferences we've encouraged our, our faculty to go to. It's really important that our faculty grow along with it, are on the same journey as our students. Columbia Nursing Committee of, on Racial Equity in Education, I chair that committee, is, has, is ongoing and continuous and always doing work. It includes faculty and students, and we've done um, quite a bit of, quite a bit of um, advancement for our faculty. Right now, our main, per, our main I guess our main product is a, is a toolkit that we put together for anti-racist pedagogy. It's a toolkit that will be disseminated very shortly. It's, it's helping faculty to um, really examine and take a deep dive into their coursework to make sure that it's inclusive, that the environment of their class is inclusive, and the content of their course is inclusive and anti-racist. 
The purpose of this toolkit is to support the evaluation and development of course materials and course content in alignment with our Columbia Anti-Racism in Education syllabus statement. And I'm going to read that syllabus statement to you. It's on all of our syllabi, and we have a commitment to it. <clears throat> Columbia University School of Nursing and its faculty are committed to ensuring anti-racist pedagogy across all programs and courses. To this end, we are engaging in intentional course examination, revision, and design to include anti-racist learning objectives and deconstruction of systemic racism and racial bias present within the field of study. Building on the foundation of an inclusive learning environment, we will incorporate diverse and inclusive content voices, authors, and guest speakers in the courses and acknowledge when it is not possible. We will elicit your response to this work in progress through formal course evaluations and welcome informal exchange throughout the term. And this is printed on all of our syllabi. You've heard a lot about some of the uh, activities that we've had. Vivian was pretty inclusive in that and our faculty participate heavily in a lot of the workshops and presentations. And we, we are very, very proud, as you also heard, that we've had plenty of faculty promotions and awards and recognition, both internally and externally. And that's part of the commitment that we have to faculty development and, and career development trajectory for, us, for our faculty. On the curricular um, and extracurricular area, there was a reference to our support for students. Um, academic coaching is an important part of what we do in academics. And we are building an academic infrastructure for success that provides relevant and multidimensional support services and programming for a diverse student body. And it includes peer and faculty-led services for um, diverse learners. And we're learning there have to be a lot of different ways to get to the same end. And um, this coaching program is addressing that. The open program was mentioned earlier, and I just want to give a couple more words to it. The open program was developed by Sally Abalela. It was her brainstorm many years ago, and it's finally come to fruition. We offer modules three times a year. They're online and asynchronous for access to students who are, or individuals who want to be nurses and want to attain the prerequisite coursework in a quality way. We have five prerequisite courses, Anatomy and Physiology 1 and 2 and Micro include a lab. Then we have Nutrition, Introduction to Developmental Psychology, and Biostats is on its way. It will be, entered, it will be uh, the, the last one, the sixth, the sixth module. This builds, um, it, we plan to build on this open program. Uh, this is, again, Dr. Abalela's brainstorm. I, will, I, will, I also will mention that all of these prere prerequisites are taught by Columbia faculty who are experts um, I always call Dr. Abel, Abelela our, our uh, advanced or our, our pathophysiology and physiology guru, and she teaches quite a few of the courses. And it's really good preparation. Uh, we plan to build on the open success and establish a post back nursing pipeline program. And this program will offer counseling on applications, advisement, um, uh, peer mentoring and faculty mentoring for students who are interested in, in pursuing nursing, in particular focused on those that don't have easy access and don't have the support structure within their family or within their, within their environment. The certificates that we, we're offering this fall, we're very proud of. The, tr the Certificate in Transgender and Gender Nonconforming is revolutionary. It's the only one in the country that we're aware of. Um, and that's thanks to Laura Kelly, who was the brainchild behind that and will be the, the director of that program. We're offering a certificate in palliative care for advanced practice nurses, a very, very important area that's growing and needs growing in that area. And we are, we're, we're expert, we have expert faculty that's led by Dr. Marlene McHugh and, uh, Doc, and Penny Bushman, Professor Penny Bushman. So thank you for putting that together. And we're really looking forward to disseminating those two CPAs, Certificates in Professional Achievement, that will also be very accessible. They're online, and they'll be synchronous and asynchronous. We have um, a Master of Science in Advanced Clinical Management and Leadership, and that's led by Heidi Hahn Schroeder. She's a big commitment to that. She just walked in. <laughs> um, and we've been, we tailored that program to NYP's needs. And now we're seeing that these needs um, are apparent in, uh, in other partners. And so we're extending the opportunity for students and some of our other partner schools, partner agencies to participate in that program as well. And it will be an annual offering. 
We've been working very hard to collaborate with, um, with, more, with more partners in the community. And um, one of the partners that, we, that we, we really built a strong collaboration with recently is Bassett Medical Center. And you'll see in, the, in your um, little bag, there's an article on that, on that strengthened um, collaboration and what, what it offers our students. It's a rural health center area. And so we're offering our students the opportunity to, to, to see uh, a different a perspective of, of how care is delivered as opposed to being in the urban area. And that's been extended not only to our pre-licensure program, but anesthesia will have placements there, midwifery, and nurse practitioners. So we're very excited about that. Mount Sinai has, has reached out to us. They're very eager to strengthen their relationship with us. Um, and we're in conversations to, have a, to strengthen that, that liaison with, with them for clinical rotations. And very recently, they asked us if we would participate in an attending model. And we will be doing, we will be doing that next, very shortly. An important collaborator is New York Health and Hospital Corporation. It's uh, the largest um, public health system, I think, in the country. Very, very, um, they, we could really work together and be uh, mutually helpful for them. They can help us and we can help them. And we're in, we're in a lot of conversations with them, with the leadership of, uh, of that system. It happens to be Natalia Sinius, who was the person who gave the, uh, one of the panelists on the, executive, on the executive panel. She also teaches for us, so she knows our students and she knows the quality of our education. So we've been having a lot of conversations with them to get more involved in, in, their, in their, all, of their, um, all of their agencies for our graduates' employment, for our students, for clinical placements, uh, for um, per, we're having very serious talks with them, inviting them to our ACML, our Advanced Clinical Management Leadership, so they can build some leadership within their own institution as well. Um, and that's been moving along very nicely. We have many meetings with lots of different agencies and, and um, corporations to build uh, clinical placements for our students. And one of the national, com one of the national companies, it really is a company, is Optum. It's an insurance company. Um, they are interested in developing clinical placements for us so that they will have a pipeline of quality NPs to be hired. So we're excited. Those are the, those are, that's just an update. Um, I'm around, so if you have any questions about any of it, I welcome them. And I'd like to, I would like to introduce, <laughs> I wrote it down, Dr. Tonda Hughes, who is the Director of Global Health. <laughs> Fourth time's charm, I guess. <laughs> Hi, I am Tonda Hughes, and I'm the Heinrich H. Ben Dixon Professor of International Nursing and Associate Dean for Global Health. I also direct the Center for Sexual and Gender Minority Health Research that you've heard about, and I'm, I'm very proud about that as well. But we talked about that last year, so I, I won't talk about that today. I'll talk about our global health initiatives, which are also very impressive. Having worked in global health for more than a decade, I was the Associate Dean for Global Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago before I came here. I'm very familiar with global health uh, programs in nursing, both in the US and really across the, the globe. And I can tell you that Columbia stands out as a leader among these programs, not just in the US, but internationally. And I'm very proud to be part of that now. When I came to Columbia five years ago, we were doing really quite well, but the student programs were actually just taking off and beginning to flourish. And this was, is thanks in no small part to Jennifer Dorn, who is the assistant director of our global initiatives uh, office and our wonderful staff led by Yuhei Fern. In 2019, you may, you may remember this from the past, but we sent a record number of 78 students to 27 different countries for six weeks. Unfortunately, COVID prevented us from sending students in 2020 and 2021, but Jennifer not only maintained relationships with our partners in those other schools throughout uh, really the world across the globe, but she strengthened um, our relationships and strengthened some of the programs that we offer. Our students, for example, partnered with students in other schools in our, in our partner schools, 
and learned about their healthcare systems and the, the particular diseases and healthcare concerns of those countries, and they learned from us. We did lots of things around um, webinars related to COVID uh, and nursing and that sort of thing. So uh, we, we owe a great debt to Jennifer Dorn, who just does an ama amazing job. We're um, also pleased um, that we are finally able to resume our program this year. And we, as we speak, have 49 students in various sites in 11 different countries. This took an amazing amount of, of planning and coordination. And we're fortunate, though, that at Columbia, we're able to work with many of our global centers, uh, particularly those this year in uh, Nairobi, Mumbai, and Beijing. What the students learn in these experiences extends far beyond clinical skills and you know, learning about health systems. It really is a life-changing experience. And we hope, uh, we plan to host a student panel in the fall where you can hear from our students about those experiences. So please stay tuned for that. Beyond our outstanding student program, we're also growing our faculty research collaborations globally. And in some ways, this has been quite easy, at least easier than our student program and the issues with COVID have been. We have faculty from Armenia, China, Romania, Russia, and the Middle East. And also because nearly all of our faculty are internationally recognized, they have networks of other researchers throughout the world. Still, my goal is to increase the number of international research collaborations that we have and for more of them to be funded. One way we support this is through our very own Elaine Larson Global Development Fund, generously uh, supported and funded by Elaine Larson, who I'm sure all of you know, um, and also um, who retired just a few years ago, but still is, is around and in fact, is with us today. Thank you, Elaine, for your generous support. Another goal of, of mine, of our office, is to increase the number of faculty who apply for the Fulbright Scholar Program. When I came to the school five years ago, hard to believe, but it's been five years, as far as I know, there had never been a faculty member who had a Fulbright. We now have two Fulbright alumni and this past year, two faculty members and one PhD student applied for Fulbright Awards. And for those of you who don't know about the Fulbright program, it's extremely prestigious for the individual who gets the award and for the school uh, from which they come. So we, uh, we really committed to, to working on this and to increasing the number of, of our faculty and students who can be part of this program. So those are just a few of the ways that we're working to grow the research arm of our offices. And now that COVID hopefully is uh, largely or the worst of it's behind us, we expect that the coming year is gonna bring many more successes and many more opportunities. Thank you all so much. Happy to answer any questions later if you have them. And <laughs> it's my honor to introduce Stephen Ferreira, <laughs> our Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. Stephen. <laughs> Thank you, Tonda. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Stephen Ferrara, Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs. Uh, happy National Nurses Day. Today is National Nurses Day. Uh, the theme of uh, the start of uh, National Nurses Week is you make a difference. And I can't help but think that uh, as we're listening to the presentations and our alumni and our students that we are making differences uh, in the lives of our patients and in our communities. Um, also, New York became the 25th state uh, with the signing of the executive budget last month to, to grant nurse practitioners full practice authority. So, we worked hard on that project. Uh, our faculty practice undoubtedly play, played a role in that. And uh, Kansas snuck in right uh, after us to be the 26th state. But we're happy to sort of be the, you know, the halfway mark of states uh, recognizing nurse practitioners for the work that we do. Uh, as you know, the Columbia Nursing Faculty Practice, the NPG, uh, is an organized system for faculty members to provide clinical services in a scholarly environment. 
it is essential for maintenance of clinical expertise and clinical expertise is essential for faculty who teach clinical nursing. It is an ideal setting for the development and study of clinical research questions and outcomes. Faculty practice enhances clinical instruction and provides an opportunity for faculty role modeling. The Washington Heights faculty practice location, along with our house calls program, have strong demand as we catch up from the disruption of COVID-19 and as we still battle that ongoing virus. In addition to providing direct patient care, we remain engaged in the following activities. We have a dental and nursing interprofessional collaboration, which there are two components to. Our house calls nurse practitioner is equipped with an intraoral camera and conducts a guided oral examination with a dentist on the other end via telehealth. The goal is to diagnose oral disease and schedule the dental van to the patient's neighborhood for necessary treatment. So we're reaching underserved patients, going into their homes and providing this essential service. There's also, also interprofessional education screenings. Family nurse practitioner students are performing hypertension and depression screenings and uh, assessment of social determinants of health in the dental clinic uh, here at Columbia. Dental and NP students jointly learn aspects of the oral exam and how health screenings can help to mitigate the effect of chronic disease. NPG clinicians precepted mid midwifery students to gain exposure to primary care in an urban practice as a component of their didactic fall primary care course. And our palliative care pilot for patients with multiple chronic conditions is actively recruiting patients and implementing advanced care planning into patient encounters in collaboration with uh, the Accountable Care Organization of New York Presbyterian. Other projects under clinical affairs include collaborating on two federally funded nurse practitioner residencies, one in an urban setting and the other in rural upstate New York, which is with Bassett Health System. New integrated nurse-led models of care with emphasis on evidence-based screenings and linking patients treated by various specialists to primary care are in development. Community outreach efforts through our, our, through our fully accredited Helene Fold Trust uh, Simulation Center include grants to address opioid overdose prevention and partnerships with Project Renewal. Finally, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to the NPG team, along with other frontline clinicians. The amount of stress and burnout being experienced by these individuals is amongst the highest it's ever been. We must develop and implement new solutions to address these issues that have been made worse because of the pandemic. Thank you. And it is my pleasure, last but not least, to introduce uh, Senior Associate Dean of Student Affairs, Judy Wolf, Dr. Judy Wolf. And I'm the last speaker. <laughs> good, mor good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Judy Wolf, and I am the Senior Associate Dean of Student Affairs. I have the honor and privilege of working with our students every day. Many of you I have helped. It's so nice to see our recent grads um, back in Alumni Weekend. I also want to thank the Alumni Development Office for increasing the font on my speech today because I left my reading glasses. Thank you. This would not have happened. With that said, thank you for providing me the opportunity to share with you the wonderful work that our student affairs team is doing to support our students. Throughout the year, we offer peer-led programming by our student organizations, weekly admissions information sessions and open houses, and individual advisement and counseling in financial aid and also other university support services and resources. We partner closely with our faculty and work with university departments such as Student Health, University Life, the Provost Office, to ensure that our students are receiving the services they need to thrive while they are with us. Um, we are totally committed to Dean Frazier's, if we admit, we commit, and we say that constantly in our office. There, you know, they say the no child left behind in our office. We say no nurse gets left behind in our office. This is just a glimpse of the exciting work that we have accomplished in the past year. 
So let me start with saying, we, you all have heard um, earlier today, the Holistic Admissions Committee and what makes this special. What makes our Holistic Admissions Committee special is that we did not only say we needed to look at our nursing students being able to handle our rigorous program, but we also knew that students um, learn differently and that students come with a wealth of life experiences. To be a nurse is not just to learn and read the textbook. It's to be empathetic. It's to be resilient. It's to be a team player. It's to be a leader. And how do you see that and read that and know that with, when you have thousands of applications? And that's really where our holistic application um, committee came in. It also was able to look at um, and what makes nursing different is that we were not just thinking about holistic, um, holistic admissions, we were also thinking of the support services we need for those students that we're accepting. It was important that our students felt supported and that we were able to not just accept diverse, inclusive students from all walks of life, but that they can graduate and that they can go on and serve their patients. So, in the past year, we have had the pleasure of working with our faculty to develop the Holistic Admissions Committee that took into account not only the academic achievements, but also the personal attributes and the life experience. We collect a lot of information from our applicants. They do video essays, a bunch of essays, uh, recommendations, and obviously transcript. But we got the opportunity to also find out more about their life experiences. What obstacles that would have they faced? How did they handle those obstacles? And how, what have they learned from them? And that's really important because as you all know, as nurses, there are gonna be obstacles, there are gonna be challenges in your career and we wanna know how you're gonna handle that and that's what makes us very different. It was important for our committee to not only accept our students but also make sure that they are resilient and empathetic leaders. We're pleased to announce that we were able to create a rubric that we implemented with this new incoming 2022 cohort and that has led to an increase both in the acceptance and the diversity of our incoming class. I am proud to say that thanks to our holistic admissions committee we are expecting 200 and something. <laughs> the MTE faculty is here and staff, so 200 <laughs> um, new students and that are going to change nursing. And we know that they're gonna change the profession to, the, to, be, to serve our, our patients um, to the best of their ability. And we're so happy and excited to see them next month. Thanks to the generos generosity of our alums and donors, we were able to also be able to award over $6 million in scholarships. $6 million in scholarship. Not only did we do that, not only do we have students who are actually going to be able to afford attending an Ivy League prestigious institution as Columbia Nursing, but they're also going to be able to come tuition free and loan free debt. That's amazing. This will be the first year that we do that. And not only are we committed to the incoming students, this year we were lucky enough to be able to award $650,000 to our first, in addition to what we already offer them of $4 million, we were able to award an additional $600,000 to our first year DMP students to show them that we are committed in their doctoral work and what they're about to do. And we're very, very proud to have done that to our students. So as you can see, we're not just committed to the admissions, we're committed to not just diversifying and accepting the best students, but financially and and academically supporting them. Um, we also were very lucky to see that our current presidential um, administration is now looking at nursing um, and in realizing, especially with the last two years, that nursing are the forefront. They are the backbone to healthcare. And so we were able to award half a million dollars to our neediest students through the federal U.S. Department of Education grants. And that was also very important that we had never had before. And so we're very happy to have done that. 
The last couple of years has shown us that nurses, while resilient, also need emotional support. And now more than ever, with our students returning to campus, Student Affairs has created a student support office that focuses on the student's mental health and well-being. Our licensed social worker, so we have a social worker on staff that provides not only individual counseling, but coordinates long-term care for our students with our student mental health office here at CUIMC campus. Um, and finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the PLAN program, our baby, or at least I like to say my baby. For many years, we have thought about the PLAN program, and it's so great that we were able to put it um, together and launch it this past year. The PLAN program, as many of you um, probably remember, was based off actually Dr. Honig's um, Robert Wood Johnson NCIN New Entry in Nursing Foundation Scholarship. That was a program that was started by Robert Wood Johnson and unfortunately uh, ended in 2010 or 2007. And we were able to, with the support of our faculty and Dean Frazier and the Dean's Council leadership and also with the support of our alums and our friends we're able to launch the plan program and the plan which stands for pathways to leadership and advancement in nursing is a program that helps students that provides financial academic emotional and professional support for students this year, we started with 20 students in our plan program, in our MDE program, and I'm happy to say that as of June, we will offer the same support services and have grown our program to help 60 students this summer. So we will have 20, 40 students in our MDE program, one PhD student, and DMP students as well participate in this plan program, which is amazing. These students have not just been successful in the past year, but they have thrived, participated in student leadership roles, volunteered in the community, and enrolled in the global integration experience. Thanks to the support that this program has received, we are so proud to welcome and work with an additional 60 students. And finally, this has been an exciting year for our office because we get to have the students back. Not that we didn't love them in Zoom, Zoom was great, but it's nice to see them and hug them and be a part of their lives and see what they accomplish every day. They are the joy that helps us all come to work in the morning. Um, and so last month we hosted our spirit day in person, which brought our faculty and staff and students together and built a day building our community and having a much needed and well-deserved day of fun. And then finally, we look forward to commencement. Commencement after two long years of virtual commencement, we are returning to in-person graduation. And we will not only be graduating the class of 2022, but we will also be celebrating this year in person the classes of 2020 and 2021. We cannot wait to join our graduates and their families in the next couple of weeks. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have a wonderful team, and behind that team are wonderful faculty and staff that help us accomplish what we do. Thank you for listening, thank you for supporting, and I hope you all have a wonderful, sunny spring, and it's good to see you all <laughs> together. So um, I guess we can go eat, right? <laughs>